uh, almost exactly 20 years ago, on the 19th of July 2003, a young woman was attacked and raped as she walked to her home in the early hours of the morning. Uh, on 10th February 2004, uh, this appellant, Mr. Andrew Malkinson, was convicted of offences of attempting to strangle that young woman to whom we have referred as C, uh, with intent to commit an indictable offence, namely rape, and two offences of raping C. He was subsequently sentenced to life imprisonment. Uh, <coughs> he, in fact, spent uh, over 17 years in custody, very substantially beyond the period specified by the trial judge uh, as the minimum term. Uh, throughout, he has denied committing uh, any uh, of the offences. Uh, he now uh, appeals against uh, his convictions, the appeal coming before the court by way of a reference from the Criminal Cases Review Commission, CCRC. <coughs> As a result of uh, scientific advances in relation to DNA testing, it, it became possible in 2022 for <coughs> tests to be carried out on samples which had been collected during the original police investigation and had been preserved uh, across the years. Uh, the outcome of that testing uh, was of two, twofold importance. Uh, first, it, it gravely weakened the case which the prosecution had presented against Mr. Malkinson at his trial. Uh, secondly, it directly implicated another man uh, to whom we have referred as Mr. B. Uh, that development <coughs> uh, led the CCRC to refer the case to this court pursuant to Section 9 of the Criminal Appeal Act 1995. Uh, the first ground of appeal advanced on behalf of Mr. Malkinson uh, reflects the reason which the CCRC gave for their referral. Further grounds, grounds two to five, uh, have also been put forward. It is recognised on all sides that this court uh, has a discretion to hear and determine those grounds even if the appeal will <coughs> be allowed on ground one. Uh, we're extremely grateful to all counsel for the submissions we have had on all the matters, including those in respect of which the court will need to decide uh, whether to give leave. Uh, we're also grateful to all those behind counsel on each side for their work in preparing and presenting this important appeal. The uh, submissions we have heard about grounds two to five uh, have all substantial and important points, uh, and the court wishes to take time uh, to reflect upon them. Uh, for that reason, and having regard in any event to the time <coughs> uh, we have reached this afternoon, it is not uh, possible for the court to give its full judgment today. Uh, however, uh, we must keep Mr. Malkinson waiting no longer to know the outcome of his appeal, uh, for we are able to decide the outcome of the appeal on the basis of ground one uh, alone. The respondent has not sought to resist the appeal on ground one uh, and we have no doubt uh, has acted entirely properly in, in that regard. Uh, having considered for ourselves the <coughs> new evidence and its effect, uh, we have uh, no doubt that the new evidence shows these convictions to be unsafe. Uh, accordingly, we <coughs> formally receive the new scientific evidence as fresh evidence 
we allow the appeals against conviction in relation to all the offences and we quash the convictions. We reserve our judgment. We will give it in writing in due course. In it, we will <coughs> give our decisions on the issues of leave and, if appropriate, the merits of grounds two to five, and we will <coughs> state the reasons for all our decisions. But whatever our decisions may be, in relation to grounds two to five. The appeal succeeds on ground one, and so, uh, Mr. Malkinson, having waited so many years, you leave the court uh, a free man, no longer subject to the conditions of your life license. I came to the police station in 2003 and told the officers I was innocent. They didn't believe me. <clears throat> I came to the Crown Court in Manchester in 2004 and told the jury I was innocent. They didn't believe me. I came to this appeal court in 2006 and told them I was innocent. They didn't believe me. I applied to the Criminal Cases Review Commission, which is supposed to investigate miscarriages of justice, and told them I was innocent. They didn't investigate, and they didn't believe me. Not, not once, but twice. Today we told this court I was innocent, and finally they listened. But I have been innocent all along. For each of those 20 years that came before today, nothing any police officer, court or commission said about me since 2003 changed that reality. You are here to gather news. That declaration from the bench in there behind me is not news to me. When a jury finds you guilty when you are innocent, reality does not change. You know you did not commit the crime. But all the people around you start living in a false fantasy universe and treat you as if you are guilty. The police, prison officers, probation, prisoners, journalists, judges. As a minority of one, you are forced to live their false fantasy. On the 2nd of August 2003, I was kidnapped by the state. It has taken nearly 20 years to persuade my kidnappers to let me go. 17 years, 4 months and 16 days of that time were spent in prison. At every parole hearing, I sat before a panel who shook their heads at me, considering me to be dangerous. And all that time, the real perpetrator, the real dangerous person, was free. More recently, I was allowed to leave prison, but with my name on the sex offenders register and under tight supervision by police and probation, I was not free. And now I have finally been exonerated. I am left outside this court without an apology, without an explanation, jobless, homeless, expected to simply slip back into the world with no acknowledgement of the gaping black hole that they opened up in my life. A black hole that looms so large behind me, even here today, that I fear it will swallow me up. That black hole is hard for a person who has never slept a night behind bars to conceive of. People convicted of rape are the lowest of the low. I did not commit the crime, but I was treated as if I did. I spent 17 years on my guard against every threat. 
17 years counting down the minutes to lock up so I could be behind my door and safe from other prisoners, but not safe from my own mind. Imagining I would die there, perhaps murdered in the kitchens by a, pris a fellow prisoner, or left to die of hypoglycemia in my cell in the night, or being driven insane by the system and dying at my own hand. But somehow I lived, told every day that I was a liar, I sought the uncomplicated truths of science and mathematics through the Open University, told every day that I was a violent monster, I sought tiny respites through Buddhism and meditation, told that I was in denial about my offending behaviour. I read everything I could about a justice system that was in denial about its mistakes. Since I was arrested in 2003, the police, the prison system and probation service have been calling me a liar because I denied that I committed the crime. They claimed I was in denial and made me serve an extra 10 more years in prison because I would not make a false confession. I am not a liar. I am not in denial. But I will tell you who is. Greater Manchester Police are liars. And they are in denial. Even after this judgment today, I predict we will see them denying responsibility for what happened. We will see them stretching credulity with their excuse making. Greater Manchester Police have been scrambling to cover up how they wrongfully convicted me for 20 years. Rather than investigate the multiple leads they were given by the public, they made a horribly traumatised woman look at a lineup with me in it, even though I didn't match the description she had given of her attacker. They exploited a hopeless heroin addict and his girlfriend, both with dishonesty convictions, having them tell the jury they identified me. They unlawfully withheld crucial evidence which would have helped my defence. Once I began appealing, the police unlawfully destroyed the victim's clothing that I was demanding be retested along with other evidence, not just once, but three times. And all this time, the person who really did this horrific crime has been at large. And this means that it's not just me who has been denied justice, it is the victim. As this is my only chance to say something to her, please allow me to address her directly. Sitting in my cell, I used to rack my brains as to how you could say you were so sure it was me when I knew it was not. I read all I could and learned about how fraught with risk the process of lineup identification is when someone has been subjected to trauma. I wondered if the police helped you to pick me. Since my release, I have had the privilege of being introduced to an American woman called Jennifer Thompson, a rape survivor who was caught up in a wrongful conviction. And she has helped me at least begin to try and understand what you went through that night and what it has been like for you since. I am so sorry that you were attacked and brutalised that night by that man. I am not the person who attacked you. But what happened to me is not your fault. I am so sorry if my fight for the truth, as I knew it to be, has caused you extra trauma. I am so sorry that the system has let you down. It let us both down. There are no winners in a wrongful conviction case, with the exception of the real perpetrator. Everyone gets failed, from the original victim to the wrongfully convicted person. 
I sincerely hope that you are receiving the support you need and the apology from the police that you deserve. Thank you.